Today's episode is all about camping trips that turned into nightmares. And I'm not just talking about burning your marshmallow in the campfire, even though that sucks. I'm talking unexplained animal attacks, supernatural occurrences, and just plain creepiness when all you want to do is get cozy by the campfire. So, enjoy these allegedly true scary stories about camping trips. By the way, I'll be re-uploading a recent video I did featuring 20 ghost stories. For some reason, my sponsor for the video is now requiring me to delete it. So I'll do that, then re-upload it, and probably add some new stories to it. Just for you guys. So you can expect that one soon. Also, if you have your own story to share, send it to us at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. The Ghosts of Glastonbury Mountain from Mythology Loves Horror Growing up in Vermont meant bonfires, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and the most beautiful autumn leaves and the best maple syrup. It also meant the weirdness that is the region known as the Bennington Triangle, which I didn't learn about until the summer I turned 20. To this day, I wish I'd never found out about that cursed place. Diane, my best friend since childhood, had always been an avid ghost hunter. She loved dragging me along to anywhere that was supposedly haunted, even if we weren't allowed to be there. The Green Mountain Cemetery, Sabin's Pasture, and the Community College of Vermont were just a few of our many stops. I never believed in the supernatural. For most of my life, I thought that her midnight graveyard visits and trips to supposedly haunted buildings were a waste of time. More of a pastime hobby than an actual passion. My mind was forcibly changed in the course of a single night in 1983. Our junior year of college had started, and Diane proposed a weekend camping trip to one of the forests in the southern part of the state. She even promised that there wouldn't be any ghost hunting on this trip, which was a nice change of pace. I just wanted to relax for a few days out in nature before the harsh Vermont winter drove us to stay inside. A week after she set up the trip, we found ourselves in the middle of the woods outside the tiny town of Somerset, Vermont. It was the morning of October 12th, and soon we had set up a nice campsite. We planned to do some hiking and swimming while we were there, so the rest of the first day was spent in lazy bliss as we canoed, chatted, and fished. That night we cooked up the trout that we had caught, and it was a peaceful night spent under the stars. I slept great. I woke up feeling refreshed and excited for our hike the next day. We got an early start on our trek up Glastonbury Mountain, and by late afternoon we had reached the summit. We rested at the top for a while. We roasted some burgers over a small campfire for dinner. We made sure to thoroughly extinguish the fire, and as the sun began to bleed out, we made our way back down the mountain on the side that would bring us closer to our camp. I wasn't looking forward to hiking in the dark, but I knew I would be fine as long as I wasn't alone. Diane and I had also made sure to wear bright colors, myself in neon yellow and her in flame red, to make it easier to see each other. We'd been extra smart and had expected to be heading back to camp in the dark, so we even had headlamps ready to go when the last of the light began to fade. We made it about a third of the way down when we stopped, because we heard crying. We stopped mid-trail scanning the area around us, trying to see what it was. It was clearly the crying of a small child, not the woman-like cries of a mountain lion or another animal. I'd spent enough time in the woods to know the difference, and something about this cry unnerved me. Not a single person lived on the mountain itself, and we hadn't seen anyone at all in the time that we'd been there. I strained my eyes, but I could not see any other flashlights or lanterns through the dense thicket. I thought I caught a glimpse of something red moving further out among the trees, but she was heading off the trail and into the trees. I yelled at her to come back, but she refused, 
saying that she couldn't just leave a kid alone in the woods. I tried to point out that a family was probably camping nearby, but she ignored me and kept walking towards the sound. Against my better judgment, I followed her, hesitating before I stepped off the trail. I didn't want her running through the inky wilderness and getting lost or hurt, but nor did I feel comfortable going off trail in a place that neither of us really knew. Within ten minutes, I regretted my decision. I'd been able to see her for the first few minutes, but then I lost sight of her shirt. Even the sound of her rapid footsteps crunching the dead autumn leaves began to fade, and no amount of shouting had brought her back. I listened, trying to pinpoint any sound, when I saw a flash of red out of the corner of my eye. I was so relieved that Diane had returned that I whipped around with a grin on my face. My relief was immediately replaced by confusion. No one was there, and after a few seconds it dawned on me that I still hadn't heard a sound. A moment later... A tug on my sleeve made me scream. I looked down in horror, my heartbeat drumming in my ears, and I saw a little boy in a red jacket. He was looking up at me with huge, tear-filled eyes, and I felt my fear soften slightly. Hey, kid, where are your parents? I, I don't know. Mom was here, but now she's not. I crouched down to eye level making sure that my headlamp was not blinding him. What's your name? Paul. I'm Jeanette. It's nice to meet you, Paul. He stuck out his hand like a little adult, and I gladly shook it with an amused smile. He was a cute kid, and for the first time I was glad that we had gone off trail to find him. Now let's go look for your mom and my friend, okay? He nodded trustingly, and he slipped his hand into mine. We had no idea which direction to take, so we made our way further into the dense woodland. I kept us going in a straight line from the path. We made sure to call for Diane and his mom every few minutes. But I was getting more and more nervous about going deeper into the woods. Even so, I still could not bring myself to abandon my friend. Nearly two hours later, we ran into the trail again, and it was very close to our campsite. I was hoping that Diane had been smart enough to wait there for me if she had made it this far, and I was extremely worried at this point. We both had a small flare gun on us in case of an emergency, and that was the only thing assuring me that she was still okay. I got a fire going, since Paul's hand was frigid and I offered to warm him up some cocoa. He politely declined and curled up in a camping chair by the fire. I sat there in our other chair for about an hour, waiting for Diane to return, and at some point, I must have dozed off. When I woke up, there was a woman by the fire with a weirdly blank look on her face. I blinked rapidly to shake the sleepiness from my eyes, thinking she was just a dream. But... The figure remained. I was confused, and I began to panic when it dawned on me who she was. Oh, you must be Paul's mom. I'm so glad you found us. My name is Paula. Oh, that's cute. You named him after you. He's not my child. Uh, I'm sorry? She hadn't moved, and the silence stretched tensely between us. I yawned and rubbed my eyes. I thought I was seeing things. A darkness began to seep from her body like a fog, and at first I thought it was just the firelight casting odd shadows or my eyes playing tricks on me. But it began to pull from her skeleton-like fingers and on to the ground. I swore, quickly scrambling back away from her out of my chair. By then I noticed that Paul wasn't in sight, I screamed for him. The woman still hadn't moved, but the ooze had reached my tent. It began to dissolve the nylon like acid, its hiss warring with the crackling of the fire. I don't remember much after that, 
except for running towards the car and trying to explain to the police what had happened. They didn't believe me, of course. When we came back to the campsite, they blamed drinking and an unguarded fire for the state of the tent, even though there was no alcohol in my system. They began searching for Diane, but never found any trace of another person. Five years later, Diane's case went cold. I wouldn't be writing this down if my 12-year-old nephew hadn't asked me to go for a school project that he was working on, one about people who have seen ghosts. When I asked my nephew why he picked me to interview, he looked up at me, just like little Paul had done long ago. He handed me an old yellowed newspaper article, dated October 14th, 1950. There was a picture of a little boy on it, in a familiar red jacket, and the headline was about his disappearance near Glastonbury Mountain on October 12th, 1950. My nephew tugged gently at my sleeve, his eyes wide as he stared at the tears flowing down my cheeks. Don't cry, Auntie. Not everyone gets to meet two ghosts in one night. What do you mean, two? Yeah, don't you ever go to the library? I shook my head. He exasperatedly pulled out a second article from his school folder. This one had a picture of the woman I'd seen that night. It was about her disappearance from the same area in 1946. They had both been wearing red when they disappeared. And now that I remembered, so had Diane. I know I'll never go back there, but I believe that if I did go back, I would see three ghosts. A Michigan Monster from Mr. Smith. Are you ready for a good old-fashioned tale of kids getting in over their heads? The following events happened a long time ago, more than a decade, in fact, but I still remember most of the details quite clearly. For a bit of context, I was born and raised in a small rural town in the southeastern U.S., but at the time of this story... A sizable enclave of my family lived in the backwoods of the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. Once a year, my parents and I would pile into the car and make the trip up to see my Michigan relatives, and we'd all converge on a small campground on the shores of Lake Superior for a three- or four-day reunion. I always looked forward to it, because that meant several days of enjoying home-cooked food by the lakeshore with family. I especially loved seeing all of my cousins, who were about my age. Plus, most of the older family members would either be preoccupied with catching up on gossip or busy making casseroles and other dishes for the cookout. This meant that all the kids were free to roam the beautiful shoreline of the lake or go hiking through the woods. Basically, we had unprecedented freedom. It was a blast. Well, usually. At this particular reunion, I was 13. Two of my cousins, Erica and Cody, were the same age as me. Another cousin named Dan was two years younger. Erica, Cody, and I always hung out together at the reunion, as we were the same age. The older cousins were too grown up to bother with us, but we were too old to be stuck with the little kids. Dan was the in-between, too old for the kindergartners, but too young for us, big and mature middle schoolers. He was funny and nice, though, so often enough we let him hang out with us. On the first day of that reunion, we did all the usual running around and swimming, but we decided that this year we would do something more daring, since we were practically grown-ups now, at least to us. To that end, we asked our cousin Bradley if there were any scary places nearby for us to explore. Bradley was kind of a jerk sometimes, but he was the youngest of the older cousins, so he was the most approachable. Besides, he was in ROTC at his high school and carried a pocket knife all the time. To us, he was pretty much as good as a space marine. Bradley acted annoyed at first, but eventually he caved and told us about a creepy, abandoned farm that bordered the campground on one side. 
The fields were still used for growing wheat and corn, even though the house and equipment shed were run down and dilapidated. He even told us a spooky tale of how the farmer who lived there had gone insane and started to take local children. Supposedly, he ate them. Of course, this story was completely made up just to scare us, but at the time, it seemed quite real to us. So, with visions of an insane, fang-toothed farmer in our heads, we all decided this would be a great place to explore to show that we were fearless adults. We spent the rest of the evening biding our time, and once our parents were asleep, we snuck out of our cabins and met at one of the picnic areas. Erica was there first, and I arrived just a few minutes before Cody, but Dan didn't show up for a while. Just when we thought he had chickened out on us, he finally came through, trotting down the path from the cabin. After a bit of teasing, we decided that we should go ahead and get moving if we wanted to get back in time to catch a little bit of sleep. We had all brought flashlights and Derek had brought her new camera. She was going through a photographer phase at the time. The campground wasn't really that big, so we were able to make it to its edge on foot in just over half an hour. We jumped over the ramshackle split rail fence bordering the campground, and we could see the old farmhouse in the distance. There was just one little problem. It was on the far side of a head-high cornfield. But we did not want this to deter us from our little investigation of the property. We began to make our way through the tall cornfield. The corn wasn't quite ready to be harvested, so it was at least green and lush but not dry and creepy. In the midst of the foliage, the air was refreshingly damp and cool as we walked. We whispered to one another about what we would do if we encountered the crazy farmer, and we teased one another with pokes and prods, seeing who was on edge the most, who was jumpy. We finally made it to the edge of the cornfield, and the terrain opened up into an overgrown grassy yard surrounding the single-story farmhouse and a run-down equipment shed. Rusted and neglected farm equipment lay scattered around the yard, surrounded by high grass and weeds. Hay balers, box scrapes, cedars, you name it. The place definitely had the creepy vibe we were looking for, maybe even a little bit too much of it. We stood in silence for a moment, then Dan and Cody both suggested we should turn back and return to the cabins, as we had seen what we came for. Erica was braver though, and she said she wanted to get some pictures of the old shed in the farmhouse. Besides, she said, with a big full moon like that in the sky, I might actually be able to see some of these pictures. If I'm honest, I was feeling a bit creeped out myself, but I did not want to look like a coward and as we had come all this way, I figured we might as well have a look around. We headed to the equipment shed first, immediately spooking a barn owl with our lights, and all but dying of fright when it screeched at us. We poked around in the shed for a few minutes, the beams of our flashlights casting terrible shadows as they shone across the rusted tines and blades of forgotten machinery. And then we began to move towards the dilapidated house, However, as we walked, we kept hearing a rustling sound, as though somebody was moving out in the cornfield. Every time we stopped to listen, the sound stopped too, almost like it was following us. Erica was not about to be discouraged, though, so we finally made it to the house. The porch was rotted and practically falling in, and attached to the door was a slip of bright orange paper encased in heavy plastic lamination, it read, Notice of Eviction, and was dated nearly a year ago. The door was sturdy and locked. We didn't want to actually break in through one of the windows, so we circled back around the building and looked for another way inside. By now, the pacing in the cornfield had stopped, so we all began to relax a little, believing it to be a raccoon or something similar. As we rounded the corner to the back of the house, we noticed that the storm cellar doors were wide open, and we figured that would be our ticket inside. However, when we reached the gaping entrance to the cellar, we were greeted with a less than welcoming sight. 
The concrete floor of the cellar was covered in animal bones and shredded skins. Deer, cattle, raccoons, dogs, birds, all skeletal or mostly skeletal. Likewise, the thick wooden doors of the cellar were covered in scratches and claw marks, like something sharp had been scraping against them regularly. The grass around the entrance to the cellar was worn down, and the dirt was packed from regular traffic. Anyone who has worked in taxidermy or forensics will tell you that old bones have a very particular smell. It's not exactly the smell of death or the scent of decay. It's something else entirely, and that cellar absolutely reeked of it. The four of us stood at the entrance of the cellar, open-mouthed and shocked. We stood stone still as though that would protect us from whatever it was that lived down there. Wordlessly, Dan and Cody backed away as Erica and I shone our flashlights down into the cellar, looking for any sign that there might have been something alive down there. But we saw nothing. Nothing but piles of bones and claw marks on the doors. That was more than enough to finally persuade Erica that she didn't need to get those pictures that bad. We all quickly made the decision to go back the way we came. We were debating if we should call the police, but then something stopped us in the middle of our whispered argument. A soft thud emanated from a rusted hay baler from halfway across the yard. It was followed up by the sound of something sharp scratching against metal. All of us looked at one another, exchanging a wordless, Did you hear that too? Look. We all shone our flashlights in the direction of the sound, and simultaneously, we all saw it. There on top of the rusty green baler was the shape of a large canine. It was way too big to be a coyote, and its fur was extremely dark. However, its outline was not quite right for a wolf either. Of course, it was hard to focus on anything except its piercing yellow-green eyes and the carcass of the two-point buck it held in its jaws. It didn't make any noise, no growling or snarling at all, but we understood the message it was communicating with its glare. A universal look that meant, leave. And leave we did. The four of us all ran headlong, screaming into the cornfield, making a desperate break for the safety of the cabins. Just as I was running into the field, however, I looked over my shoulder, making sure that the beast was not following us. It wasn't, but when I looked back, what I saw was almost as unsettling. The animal had stood up. It was standing on its hind legs, now holding the deer carcass in its arms as it watched us leave. I only looked back for a second, but I know what I saw. After that, the whole memory is a blur. I returned to my cabin and bolted inside, and I remember seeing Dan and Cody running by as I was fumbling with the door, followed shortly by Erica. We weren't feeling very grown up all of a sudden. I ran to my bed in the cabin, and I hid under the sheets, eventually falling asleep. The following morning, I wasn't even sure if everything from the night before was real, or it was just a bad dream. However, when my cousins and I met up for breakfast, we all agreed that what we'd seen was real. When I mentioned that I had looked back and I saw the monster stand up, Dan and Erica suggested that maybe it was Bradley playing a prank on us, as wolves obviously did not stand on two legs like that. The thing is, Cody then told us that when he had returned to the cabin, Bradley was sound asleep on the couch and there was no way he could have beaten us home without us ever having seen him running ahead of us. And where the heck had he gotten such an elaborate costume? Besides, even though Bradley was a pretty big guy, 15 years old and over 6 feet tall, he definitely wasn't big enough to account for the height of the thing I'd seen the night before. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with farm equipment, but a full-size round baler is a big piece of machinery and this thing was more than half the height of the baler. It must have been seven feet tall at the very least. 
As these stories often say, I'm not sure what the thing was that I saw. But to this day, whenever I talk to my cousin Erica, the subject of that night almost always comes up. She says her biggest regret is not stopping to take a picture of that basement full of bones, or the creature as it stood silhouetted against the brilliant light of the summer moon. But I always tell her that she did the right thing by just running away. The four of us have never told the rest of our family about our experiences there, and the farmhouse and outbuildings have since been torn down. Most of my family from that area has either died or moved away now, so we don't have the yearly reunions anymore. But I'll never forget what I saw that night, and if I ever go back, I'll be sure to be armed. After all, who knows if that thing is still out there? If you ever go out walking in the woods and farmland of the Upper Peninsula, take heed. There's something out there with claws, teeth, and a hell of a lot of fur. It walks on two legs, and when you meet it, it might be hungry, and it might just take you to its cellar. Warning, this story contains graphic depictions of hurt animals. I went camping when I was younger, from All Calm 1999. This started when I used to live in a small town in Arkansas. It had a population of around 5,000. It was your average conservative town. In the summers, it was hot and humid. In the winter, it was dark and cold. I grew up on southern entertainment, driving four-wheelers, hunting every deer season, maybe even laying a bit of trapping here and there. This story occurred my last year of high school. I would have been 17 at the time, I had plenty of friends, a great girlfriend, and an old shabby 1972 F-100 Ford pickup. Of course, I have still got the pickup to this day. It was November, rifle season, and I'd been preparing for it for a while. My friend Drew and I had been planning this trip, and we had everything ready. It was Friday, the end of the week, and the start of the weekend. Our plan was to hike up through the National Forest onto the mountain, and then set up camp, and just have a great time. I woke at three in the morning, leaving a note for my parents, and putting my things in the bed of my truck. I hopped in and drove to my friend's house. When I arrived, he was already waiting on the porch. He placed his bag in the bed of the truck, then put the gun in the truck. After that, we took off to the mountain. We entered onto the turn that went through to the entrance of the hiking site, the change from road to dirt was just as familiar as ever. We stopped and got out, carrying our bags and heading up the mountain trail. It was around seven. Thanks to the sun shining over the trees, we were able to see where we were going easily. The birds were chirping, and I could see plenty of squirrels running through the trees and chattering at one another. About three hours of hiking later, we came up to the campsite that we followed with our map. As we arrived, we began to quickly set up tarps, and we were quick to find firewood and start a good fire. I told my friend that I would get us some lunch, and I headed off with my rifle to go get something to eat. I walked for at least half a mile south when I found myself breaking the tree line. I decided I'd sit and watch for a bit, I sat underneath a large oak and looked for any movement. The sun was rising slowly. I was sitting there when all the birds stopped for a moment. The silence became deafening. There was a sharp ringing in my ear. It was so eerie. I began to slowly scan my surroundings, making sure to stay as still as possible. I noticed then that there was a deer standing at the other side of the field. It was hard to make out. I slowly raised my rifle and looked down the hill. I only saw its head and neck from where I was. I knew that if I risked a shot then, that I wouldn't have another chance to bag another deer with a better shot. Regardless, it was a doe anyway. That's when I noticed something else. The deer's head was higher off the ground than most deer should be capable of. 
and it moved unnaturally. It turned to the left, and I could hear leaves crunching as it moved deep into the dark forest. I was a little bit unsettled, so I decided to head back to camp and be handed. I followed the mental landmarks that I saw the first time. I fallen over a tree, dried up creek bed. Soon I could see the tarps in the distance through the trees. When I made it back to the campsite, we fiddled around for the rest of the day, shut up some rabbits, and later we decided that it was time to catch some sleep. I crawled into my tent, admittedly exhausted, and got into my sleeping bag. It didn't take long for sleep to come. We got up early the next morning. It was still as eerie as it was the day before, and felt so desolate. Again, the animals were quiet, just utter silence. It was strange, because the air felt heavy too. There weren't even birds today, no deer, no rabbits or anything. We went our separate ways. We were getting hungry, and when the sun set, we had been nestled down waiting for some game to come around. It was getting dark again fast. We met back up later, and were forced to eat some of the cans of beans that we had packed, just in case we had nothing to shoot. As we ate in quiet, Drew got up from his seat and said to me, I'll be right back. Gotta take a pass. I stayed there drinking some water, watching the fire dance rapidly. As the minutes passed by, I grew painfully aware that Drew had been gone for a long time. I was starting to get concerned. But then I began to hear leaves crunching. I looked towards the sound and out came Drew, but his face was ghostly pale. He simply told me to follow him. What's going on, man? I asked. But he kept insisting without an answer. I got up to follow him into the woods as he asked. We walked what I can assume about 40 yards when I got a waft of something foil, something repugnant. It got stronger and stronger the farther we walked. The smell grew so bad that when something fell on my shoulder, I breathed in a smell of it, and the reek of death made my stomach churn. I bent over and vomited, causing whatever fell on me to fall on the forest floor. I pulled out my light and pointed it at the ground. I was dumbfounded. There was blood dripping on me from above. Shaking and hesitant, I slowly panned my flashlight up. There were parts of animal hanging above us all over the place. Organs, limbs, pieces of everything and anything placed in the trees. There was a squirrel hung on the branch, impaled by one of the wooden outcrops. I looked at Drew, still drained of all color. Together, we bolted back to camp. I grabbed my rifle, gathered some things. Then we stopped in the middle of the campsite and looked at each other. Confused, terrified. What were we going to do in a situation like this? We sat down to collect ourselves for a few seconds. We began to shove our food and things back into the trail packs. And as we did, we began to hear crunching a few yards away from us. I pulled out my mag light and pointed it towards where we heard the sound. We were about eight yards away from where we heard it. I flicked on the flashlight. There wasn't anything there. With some relief, we lowered our guns. But not a second later, a grotesque and elongated hand came from around a tree in front of us. We didn't wait. We sprinted down the hill, phasing in and out of running or jogging doing the absolute most at any given moment that our bodies would allow. My lungs were burning, legs were stinging, but I kept running. I would glance back and check on Drew and how close he was behind me. I turned off my flashlight, so did Drew, and we laid up against a tree as still as possible. I could see Drew's icy breaths in the moonlight, my eyes finally adjusted to the dark. I saw it. An arm, long and bony, covered in blood. 
long fingers with unkempt nails that were curved. It was grabbing on to Drew's shoulder, and Drew had begun screaming. The moment I reacted, the arm began to drag him across the forest floor. I sat there frozen, unable to do more than just flinch as I watched. He kept screaming until it all stopped. His screaming stopped. The sounds of my friend struggling stopped. It was all just silence again. I picked myself up and ran, but I tripped over something, falling downhill for a bit before slamming against a tree. I stopped. My back was hurting and I had twisted my ankle before the fall. It was quiet again. There were no crickets, nothing but silence. My eyes already adjusted to the dark, so I could see through the woods kind of well. So I laid as still as possible and observed. Before long, I heard leaves shuffling, and I saw that thing moving through the woods. It was strange and jagged and tense. It moved in a way that was so unnatural, like every millimeter of movement was indescribable in pain to the creature. It was just wrong, but it was long and thin, bones rubbing up against its skin from the inside, as if it was malnourished. I couldn't make out everything at first, but as it got closer, it put its face to the ground and began to sniff the forest floor, sniffing for me. I got a good look at its face then, its features. It was scary. Its chin was elongated and had small, beady eyes. There were dark circles of skin around them, and the skin was darkish gray. Its mouth was large, and it spread all the way across its face. It had its teeth bared, all dragon and broken looking. Its eyes were bright yellow, and they looked like they glowed. Its mouth and nose, or what was a nose, I think, was covered in a red fluid. It trailed down and covered its torso. I was ten yards away from it then. It sniffed a bit, turned to me, and began to crawl on all fours towards me. I smelled it then. It smelled of roadkill. I vomited in my mouth, but I swallowed it back down, too scared to move. I prayed that it hadn't actually found me yet. I knew I had to keep absolutely still. I laid there for God knows how long as it crawled about, searching for me. I couldn't take it much longer. I stood up slowly, grabbing my bag. I turned and slung it into the woods. Then, the moment it hit the ground, I ran for it. I ran for the parking lot as quickly as I could. I could hear the shrill and deep screech of that thing as it realized that the bag was not its target. But I kept running. I didn't recognize anything at first until I ran into a sign that said National Forest. I heard the same screech but kept going until I made it to the truck. I flung the door open, jumped inside and started it. I peeled out when I hit the gas, slinging gravel all over the parking lot. As I sped away, I looked back and saw it there, standing in the parking lot light, now shown in detail, standing around nine feet tall. Eyes full of hatred, or was it hunger? I looked forward and put the pedal to the floor. I tore off down the side road and onto the highway. When I was able to sigh with relief, I looked in the mirror. My clothes were shredded and ripped. I was covered in dirt and a bit of blood. I scratched my head, then floored it to the next police station. It took them a while to get me to calm down enough to not scream. I managed to get some game wardens and police officers together the next day. They scaled the mountain, looking for Drew but I never saw him again. A long time after that, my grandfather came down and talked to me. He explained a few things for me, told me that people had been going missing and getting kidnapped there since the 1800s, and that he's seen the thing that's been doing it himself. 
it's been eight years since I last saw Drew. Not a day goes by that I don't think of him. He was my best friend. Take my story as a warning. If you ever go camping, always take a weapon to protect yourself. And for God's sake, do not underestimate the stories you've heard about things that happen out there. Or it might happen. The Beast of you. Crystal Creek from Harry K. This happened August 2nd of 2019. I've no idea what we encountered. And I'm sharing with you not only to warn you, but also to get some information about what we might have seen. Feel free to judge for yourself. It was the morning of August 2nd. For two days now, my significant other and I, who I'll refer to as S.O., had been camping far inland from Euler State Park, a fair bit from Green Mountain Falls, right on the edge of Crystal Creek, located in central Colorado. It was a remote location which needed a good hike to get to. We had our tent set up at the edge of a circular clearing in the woods, which had about a 10 meter diameter, with trees enclosing all sides except for a small break where a path was. As I got out of the tent, my SO was sitting just outside, taking in the morning air. Immediately, she retched and said that it smelled of blood. I took a big whiff too. It was heavy ozone and overpoweringly coppery, probably prefixed to a storm, I said. We thought nothing of it after that and began preparing our tent ration breakfast. Six hours later in the afternoon, we decided we wanted to make a proper fire. Making sure our tent was sealed up, we opted to forage in the woods for appropriate kindling and decently sized stones to reflect the heat. We were only about 45 meters from camp when odd things began to happen. At this point, the coppery smell was completely faded, and so when it came back so suddenly, we noticed it right away. The air grew heavy as the smell became overpowering. Me and my SO both tried to cover our noses with our shirts, but it really didn't help. We continued collecting for the fire, fighting through the urge to gag on the smell. A few minutes later, we heard something. Maybe 10 meters away from us, there was rushing, like an animal moving quickly, and also this weird noise. It sounded like someone or something jittering their voice while mid-laugh. If you want a reference to search, try Peter Griffin's laugh, only in monotone. It was much deeper too, almost distorted, like it was coming from strained vocal cords. The animal was fast, and it seemed to be darting around in the undergrowth right beyond our eyesight. From the way the brush moved and the sound, it seemed large too. My SO was terrified, and so was I, afraid of a potentially dangerous and weird-sounding animal. We began to walk quickly back to the camp, preparing to drop our stones and wood to run if necessary. The noise seemed to always stay close by, but never close enough to see what was making it. As we got into the clearing, it seemed to stop altogether. We were both shaken up by this, but we assumed it to be an animal we didn't have much experience with. We didn't lose much of our material on the rush back, so we began assembling a small fire pit. The rest of the afternoon was uneventful, and when night came, we headed inside before it got too dark. A while after we fell asleep, maybe around two in the morning, my SO got up, and I woke up as well. I heard her crawling outside, then she started yelling at me. Babe, come here. What are you doing? This chilled me to the bone as I was obviously right behind her in the tent. I turned my phone's flashlight on and called her name. She turned around, and when she saw me, her face went white. What? How are you inside? You just called me from outside the tent. She grew even more pale and started shaking. I knew she was terrified. I quickly rose and pulled her inside the tent. What are you talking about? I've been inside the whole time. No one's out there. She looked petrified. 
and she said, Harry, you're out there. I was beyond horrified. She was completely convinced that someone who sounded exactly like me was calling to her from the woods. Despite being afraid, I knew I had to appear confident, so I didn't heighten my partner's now extreme anxiety. I grabbed a flashlight and small hunting knife from my backpack. I really am not skilled with weapons, but I thought it might be intimidating enough to ward off whatever was out there, especially if it's just some people trying to scare us for fun. I calmed her down, telling her everything would be okay and that I would go to check. I left the tent, flashlight and knife in hand. I still regret not just staying in there and sleeping the night away. When I exited into the clearing, I did a quick scan with my flashlight. I didn't see anything at first, but then, looking down, I noticed something odd. All the stones around the fire pit were moved, thrown about the camp clearing in seemingly random order. When I noticed this, I bent down to pick up one of the stones. It was extremely hot to the touch, despite the fire being out for a few hours. As I kneeled, examining the stone, the copper smell suddenly filled my nostrils again, far stronger than any time previous. Then, I heard a voice coming from right in front of me, just in the darkness, opposite the direction of the tent. In my exact voice and tone and inflection, it spoke the words I said to my SO seconds before. Don't worry, honey. Everything is fine. A sudden cold came over me, the type of cold that washes over you when you knew you really messed up. Without thinking, I raised my flashlight up. There stood the most horrific thing I'd ever encountered. It was huge. I'm about five foot ten, and this thing had at least two feet on me. It was an extremely decayed, tortured-looking elk, but its body was long as if it had been stretched. Parts of its skin were falling off or missing, and it had a distinctive servine skull formation. Its body was draped in a loose brown, dirty tarp, and it was horribly skinny, with skin and flesh missing around the ribs completely. I didn't dare examine it more. I began to winch backwards, breathless, nearly paralyzed, and then the beast suddenly emitted a blood-curdling, high-pitched scream and just runs off out of the clearing. I heard leaves and branches break for a good few minutes before it finally left earshot. Only then did I return to the tent, trembling, trying to calm myself. My SO was on the verge of breaking down, and so naturally I didn't tell her the truth. I told her that I just saw a deer, and that we surprised each other, causing the thing to scream. I reiterated that there was nothing outside to be afraid of, and we both went to sleep. Or tried to, anyway. I'm pretty sure both of us spent the entire night pretending to rest, all the while terrified of every stray noise we'd heard outside the tent. As soon as daylight struck, we packed up and left, and as we did, I got a good look at the pattern the stones were in. They created a narrow arch that perfectly resembled a crescent moon, bending around where our tent was at its axis. Sufficed to say, I never have been more terrified than that night in the woods. I still have no idea what I encountered, but maybe someone who hears this story will. Whatever it was, I hope it's native Crystal Creek, Colorado. And if you happen to be planning a camping trip down there anytime soon, I'd pick somewhere else if I were you. Good luck and stay safe. Something Awful on a School Camping Trip from Louie The school I'm in, we go on camping trips four times a year. Two at the beginning and two towards the end. This camping trip was the third one of that year. The crew of 11 people headed out on Tuesday to set up camp. We found a very gorgeous campsite that was near the river. 
It was peaceful, but ended up far from it. The weirdness happened on the very first night when literally everyone woke up from nightmares. That is, 11 people all having nightmares on the same night and waking up from them. It was crazy and obviously creepy. We brushed it off and moved on with the day. As we were getting ready for the day, I kept seeing glimpses of people out of the corner of my eyes. I thought I was just seeing things. We went through the day and got back to camp at around 6pm. We had dinner, then everyone settled into their own worlds. I ended up going to bed around 9. But I woke up at 1.34am. At first I thought I had to go to the bathroom, but then I heard them. It was three of my friends that had recently passed in the last two years. Their deaths were very hard on me, and hearing their voices out of nowhere scared and tormented me. I curled up into a ball and cried while they kept saying, Louie, come here. Come with us, Louie. This went on for what felt like hours, until I finally worked up the courage to wake my best friend up. He was sleeping in the same tent as me. He knows me very well and can help calm me down no matter what. I woke him, crying my heart out to him. He got up, talked to me, kept me company until I calmed down. But after that, I had the urgent need to go to the bathroom. But of course, I was far too scared to go by myself. My friend got up with me and we went over to the outhouse. After I did my business, I walked out to see my friend staring up at the sky. I asked what he was looking at, and he pointed up at the moon. I looked up, and as soon as I did, I felt this wave of nausea hit. I threw up my dinner immediately, but that snapped my friend out of his trance of the moon. After I was done, we jogged back to the tent, and we remained there until I fell asleep. I have no clue what was in those woods, but it was dark, and I think it was evil. My friend has told me that ever since that trip, he has had trouble sleeping. He sees and hears things at night. We have no idea what's happening, but whatever was out there that night, it probably came home with us. Backyard Camping from Michael131. I don't remember how old I was. I believe I was seven years old. We had just moved in next door to my neighbor, whom we've known for about 15 years and was basically family. It was the 4th of July. I just got back from Wyoming. We had asked our neighbor if we could gather a bunch of our friends and camp in her backyard. She said yes so we set up some tents and watched the fireworks before heading to our tents for the night. Sometime during the night, my sister had gotten up to go to the bathroom. She soon came back, seemingly uneventful. Later that evening, we heard huffing noises outside the tent. Mind you, bears around our parts in a rural village in Ohio, we don't have a dense enough forest to house bears. Usually, it's just coyotes and deer and smaller predators but it was a full moon, so we could see pretty well. Just outside the tents, it was a well-lit field. Keep this in mind, the footsteps and huffing noises kept circling the tents, and everyone heard it. As it approached my tent, I made out the unmistakable figure of a bear, seemingly searching for food or other scavengeable products. All of us were unarmed, as the massive creature began to paw and bite at the tent, easily creating ribbons out of the tent nylon. I'm not sure if it knew I was inside the tent, but it definitely wanted inside. Suddenly, one of my friends screamed, and the thing bounded away before it could get all the way in. This was terrifying. Imagine growing up in an area where bears don't exist, only to wake up in the middle of the night in a tent as one begins to chew through the wall. I'm so glad it was able to be scared away. Apparently, it wasn't that hungry. If you're wondering where the bear came from, 
it was apparently an escaped bear from a local zoo. And it just happened to come our way. The Little Girl from Burgherder. I was visiting some of my girlfriend's friends in her hometown of Rock Creek, British Columbia, Canada. It's one of those kinds of towns that has a gas station, a restaurant and a bar, and a couple of local shops. Very little there. Her family owns an acreage there consisting of a long driveway, a kind of run-down house, a shop, and a small animal enclosure with barns. It was summer and gets very warm that time of year in the area, so we decided to set up a tent on the deck of the shop and sleep outside. The shop is two stories, so the deck is fairly high up. We spent the day with her friend. It was getting late, so we decided to go set up our makeshift camp. Her friend said she may come by at some point and hang out later, so off we went back to the property. When we got there, it was a bit windy, but it was a clear summer night. We set up a propane fire pit and just hung out for a bit. It got dark and we were tired from traveling that day, so we went to bed, figuring her friend decided not to come. This is when things got weird. Not more than 10 minutes after being in bed, we heard a girl laughing in the distance. It was close enough it sounded like it was from the driveway area. We assumed her friend came up after all, so we crawled out of our tents and set up the chairs again. We waited, and no one came around. We chalked it up to the wind. We get back into bed and not more than 10 minutes goes by before we hear it again. This girl laughing sounded closer this time. But now we were creeped out, so we didn't want to investigate. I know most people want the juicy tale of some grotesque sight, but screw that, I was not going out there. After the second time, we didn't hear it again, and we eventually fell asleep, still blaming the wind. The following day, we mentioned the story to her dad. He told us a tale about some years back before he bought the farm in the 70s, there was a family that lived there, a man, his wife, and daughter. The daughter was apparently killed in a farming accident. She was backed over by a tractor. I've been to the property since, but I'll never go back at night. After hearing that story, I'm glad I stayed in the tent. Now that you've heard some creepy camping stories... You're probably one happy camper, but if you don't take these stories as cautionary tales, you might wind up a dead one. Remember, when you hear someone crying or laughing in the middle of the night, when you hear your friend's voice calling you, even though they're right next to you, don't leave your tent. Because that thin nylon wall is your last line of defense against the world of horror and mystery that is the woods. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have a story of your own you want to narrate it, share it with us at darkstories.org. If you want to support the show, check the links below. There's a link to my podcast, a link to donate to my Patreon, a link to my merch store where we have creepy shirts, and a link to start investing with acorns which helps me out a little bit too. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode about three middle-of-nowhere scary stories. Angel Nicole says, Can you do scary school stories? Heck yeah. It's been a while since I've done that. I've been on a countryside-slash-wilderness kick for a while, but I can definitely go back to school stories. Sir Lucas says, I'm in the middle of nowhere right now. Thanks, Darko. Nice. I tried to rent a cabin where I live, but the GPS took us way, way, way out in the middle of nowhere and there was nothing there, so that was creepy. Just some Bigfoot with internet access says, We Bigfoots have entered the chat. Sweet. Send us some furry lewds, please. Mo says, I miss the outro music. Sad face. Well, I've been trying to use that music less and less. All the music I use that comes from that source is risky, 
If there ever comes a day where I can't afford the subscription for that music, every single video that used any of the music from there would instantly get claimed. What a bad day that would be. Rachel Shipton says, If the middle of nowhere is anywhere like they have in Courage the Cowardly Dog, I wouldn't like to go. I don't know. I think I'd love to go visit Courage, Eustace, and Muriel. It'd be a great, creepy, life-or-death time. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't you worry, because more scary stories are on the way soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They're great people. Remember, stay safe out there, and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.